Welcome. My name is Trevor Higgins. I'm the Director of Clinical Biochemistry at a large community laboratory in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I'm also Clinical Professor of Medicine in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at the University of Alberta. Today we're going to talk about the challenges of hemoglobin A1c, challenges faced by both the manufacturer and laboratories in performing this test. Let's first of all remind ourselves about how A1C is formed. It's a non-enzymatic reaction that takes a lot of energy. In it, glucose attaches to the uh, N-terminal valine of the hemoglobin to form an unstable intermediate. That intermediate can go one of two ways. It can either go forward to form an stable end product, hemoglobin A1C, or it can reverse in reaction and form glucose and uh, hemoglobin. So we can see that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between glucose and hemoglobin and hemoglobin A1C. So why do we measure A1C? Well, first of all, there is a recommended use by all major diabetes societies in the Western world that it's an aid in the diagnosis of diabetes. The more traditional use is that it's been used to monitor glycemic control in individuals who have diabetes. And that uh, monitoring of glycemic control takes place by either checking the self-monitoring blood glucose device against hemoglobin A1c. And after checking it out, you can either reinforce the patient that the patient is doing well or encourage them to do better. Now there is a new proposed use in that hemoglobin A1c actually is a risk marker for uh, mortality in non-diabetics. But of course that use is controversial and we're not going to talk about it in our presentation. So this large increase in the use of hemoglobin A1c in the diagnosis of diabetes and in the monitoring of diabetes has led to challenges uh, in, for the laboratory and for manufacturers. This increase, we have seen a large increase in test volume. In our laboratory, it is the, one of the fastest growing tests, increasing by about 15% per year. The second challenge has been the increase in analytical expectations. The precision level demanded now of A1C analysis is much lower than used to be in previous years. At one stage, 3.5% within a laboratory was adequate. Now, 2% is required. The third um, challenge has been the increase in complexity of testing due to ethnic diversity. And this is particularly true as immigrants come to North America and to Europe. We are seeing a large increase in the number of hemoglobin variants that challenge the analytical systems that we use in measuring hemoglobin A1c. So the question then becomes, is there a tremendous increase in diabetes? If we look at the world statistics, compared with 1980 versus 2014, there's over a 300% increase in the number of individuals diagnosed as diabetic. If we look down to the global prevalence, it's risen from 4.7% in 1980 to 8.5% in 2014. The World Health Organization predicts that by 2030, diabetes will be the seventh leading cause of death in the world. So let's ask the question, are there more people with diabetes? And the standard reasons given for this increase is that we have an aging population and that we have a change in lifestyle. We're much more sedentary. We sit by the TV with our remote instead of walking up to the TV and changing channels. We have a poorer diet in that we eat a lot of carbohydrates or fast food. For our indigenous or native populations, there is an increase to adequate food supply, which is postulated as the reason for large increases in the number of diabetics found in indigenous populations. However, in a controversial paper published in 2012, it has been suggested that the biggest influence 
in increasing the number of individuals diagnosed with diabetes is due to the change in threshold for fasting glucose from 7.8 down to 7.0. So why are glucose and A1C correlated? Well, first of all, A1C is thought to be a time average blood glucose over the lifetime of the red blood cell. So we can look at glucose as being a snapshot. This is what gl the glucose level in the individual is at this particular moment of time. We could look on hemoglobin A1c as a video. This is what the glucose has looked like over the past 90 to 120 days. So think of glucose as a snapshot and A1c as a video. There is, however, a calculator for calculating an estimated average blood glucose from the hemoglobin A1c. <clears throat> when we took that calculation and we applied it to data in the um, NHAIN study in the United States, we found that the best correlation between glucose and A1c was found with the fasting glucose, which kind of, is kind of surprising for us because we look at fasting glucose as being the low point in the glucose concentration over the time, uh, daytime, rather than being an, ester, an, an average uh, glucose concentration. So that kind of surprised us. So what tests do we have to help us in the diagnosis of diabetes? The first is a fast, fasting or random glucose. The second is an oral glucose tolerance test. The third is hemoglobin A1c. There is a, a rider, a caveat, that testing should be confirmed on a separate occasion by repeating the same test within an appropriate time frame. So the same test done, uh, repeated in an appropriate time frame. So <clears throat> there are some problems with the oral glucose tolerance test in glucose. The first problem is that the oral glucose tolerance test is not reproducible. If you did it on five successive days, it is quite possible you will get five different answers. So that's not very good. There is also a problem with patient compliance. Patients have to spend two hours in the laboratory. And one of the common questions we get is, can I leave the lab to go shopping? Whereas the rule book says, the patient has to be at rest for the two hours in which the, the patient is taking the oral glucose tolerance test. The glucose drink tastes awful. There is simply no other word for it. And so there's an aversion to the glucose drink. And by the way, it only comes in orange and some people have a reaction to orange. The other problem is fasting. What constitutes fasting? People turn up at the lab having had a coffee. I didn't eat anything, but I did have a coffee. Oh, I had some sugarless gum. Does that constitute a fasting sample? So fasting itself provides some problems. It's time consuming for a phlebotomist. She has to explain about the drink. She has to be present to collect two samples. There are problems with the post collection. Glucose starts to degrade fairly soon after the sample is collected. And if the plasma is not separated from the red blood cell, there is a substantial decrease in the glucose concentration. And so there are some post-analytical challenges. And so given the fact that there is this increase in the incidence of diabetes, is it better to use a more patient-friendly test to aid in the diagnosis of diabetes than the oral glucose tolerance test. So this is the rationale for using A1C as an aid in diagnosis of diabetes. First of all, there's a better correlation with the complications than glucose, particularly retinopathy. There's no pre-analytical factors such as fasting. Patients can turn up whenever it's convenient and have their blood collected. The sample does not need to be immediately processed like a glucose since the sample does not deteriorate on standing. The A1C method is standardized throughout the world. It's now recommended by the diabetes societies worldwide. 
So in conversations with physicians, they have moved to hemoglobin A1c as an aid to diagnosis because of the recommendations and, as they say, patient convenience. But some people have suggested that cost may be a reason not to use. So in a comparison that we did, we took the cost of the analysis of collection and analysis of two glucose samples, two hemoglobin A1c samples, and the use of an oral glucose tolerance test followed later by a fasting glucose. If you look at them, the, the cost or the argument against using A1c as prohibitively expensive, it doesn't actually hold water. But there are some caveats on using A1c as a diagnosis for diabetes. So the first case study is a 67-year-old male who is a known diabetic. He has a hemoglobin A1c performed with a value of 2.3%. The nurse from the diabetic clinic phones and asks for a repeat A1c because the lab made an error on the hemoglobin A1c result because his random glucose is 118 or somewhere in the region of 220 milligrams per deciliter. So because hemoglobin A1c is tested every, only every 90 days in uh, Edmonton, she required approval from a clinical biochemist before the A1c test could be performed. So when we took a look at the CBC, we found that this individual had a, large, a vastly increased absolute particular site count well above the, the reference interval, and why his A1c was low is because he was turning over red blood cells at a greatly increased rate, and so that decreased the hemoglobin A1c. So now we have a problem. Glucose is telling us one story, the A1c is telling us another story, so now we have developed a test called fructosamine, which is thought upon as glycated protein. And you can see from the fructosamine that it is elevated above the reference interval. So let me give you a second caveat. Here's a 57-year-old Caucasian female presents with non-Pacific complaint of tiredness and lethargy. The physician orders a hemoglobin A1c because he's following the guidelines of the societies. And we obtain a hemoglobin A1c of 47.6%. Phenomenally high. Now that's completely absurd given that the estimated average glucose concentration would be 63.3 millimoles per litre, or well over 500 milligrams per deciliter. However, when we measured her glucose, it was only 5.4 millimoles per litre. So there's obviously a vast discrepancy between the A1c and the, the glucose. So we did it by an alternative method, and we got a result of 4.0, which is much more in keeping with her glucose. So there's another caveat. We've seen one too low. We've seen one too high. Now here's a third caveat. A 68-year-old female is diagnosed as diabetic on the basis of two successive hemoglobin A1c results, which are both elevated. According to the Canadian Diabetes Association guidelines, she has met the diagnosis for being a diabetic. She was put on metformin with no reduction in hemoglobin A1c. So the physician initiated insulin therapy. The patient experienced hypoglycemic episodes, some quite severe. So the endocrinologist, who's a friend of mine, asked for help in resolving the case. So what we found is that this individual had an unusual hemoglobin variant that alluded with hemoglobin A1c and with hemoglobin F, causing a false elevation in the hemoglobin A1c. The immunoassay method gave a result of 5.5, but that's not really a true answer anyway, for reasons which I will explain later. So now we've identified that this hemoglobin variant is hemoglobin wane. We've identified it in 15 individuals all related to this original study. Now there's a fourth caveat in which when it, the recommendation came out to use hemoglobin A1c into, uh, as an aid to diagnose diabetes, we were a little skeptical. So we took three years worth of data 
and we found 3,163 data pairs in which the A1C and the oral glucose tolerance test were ordered together. 568 were positive for diabetes using the 2003 Canadian Diabetes Association criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes. So just to compare our data with other data, um, particularly in Canada and the United States, we asked for data from two other laboratories. So let's take a look at this data, first of all on the upper table of positive predictive value. So we chose values of 5.7, 6.0, 6.5, and 7.0. And you will see at a value of 6.5 in the NHANES study that the positive predictive value for aid in the diagnosis of diabetes is 1.0. It's a perfect test. In the real world, in our laboratory, it was only 0.4, which is actually worse than tossing a coin. When we looked at the data from Marshfield, which is a community laboratory, uh, we found that it was not much better, 0.42. When we looked at Spokane, which was a mixture of hospital and community setting, they were a little better at 6.1. But none of them approached the value of 1.0 for a positive predictive value um, for the aid as a diagnosis of diabetes set at 6.5. When we looked at negative predictive values, Hemoglobin A1c is a superb test for ruling out diabetes. So it's good for ruling out diabetes. It's not very good for ruling in diabetes. So we thought we were unusual in the world at finding this out, but we found that studies published in Holland and Germany just after we published our paper confirmed these results. So the suggestion is that we may be measuring different things between hemoglobin A1c and the oral glucose tolerance test, and therefore the results will not be equivalent. Finish off with one last study in our case studies. Here's a patient, 27 years old. His initial result for a fasting glucose is 14.1, which is about 300 milligrams per deciliter, strongly suggestive of diabetes whereas hemoglobin A1c is 4.0, which is suggestive that this individual is not diabetic. I was asked to investigate this case and got another specimen. Again, the hemoglobin A1c was low, or quite low, at 3.8. The fasting glucose was high at around 200 milligrams per deciliter, or 11.1 millimoles per liter, and we tried it on several A1c methodologies all that gave a result somewhere around the 4.0 range. So the results are consistent. We also did a urine glucose and the result was plus one. So we looked at the CBC to see whether there was an increased turnover of red blood cell, whether the patient was macrocytic, but found nothing unusual in the CBC. We have yet to explain why this person has a high glucose, but a low A1C. The things we need to remember is that there are a lot of factors that affect A1C values. First of all is, as we get older, our A1C tends to go up. In gender, females tend to have higher A1C values than males. Individuals with hemoglobin S tend to have higher values than those without hemoglobin S. Those who smoke have higher hemoglobin A1C values than those who do not smoke. If you live in a cold climate like I do, you will find that the hemoglobin A1C is higher in January than it is in June. It is very temperature dependent. The colder the outside temperature, the higher the A1C. There's some interference from medications. Riboverin, for example, dramatically decreases the hemoglobin A1C. If you are iron deficient, then that will increase the A1C. And there's a strong suggestion that you actually uh, get the patient's iron status back to normal before you measure the A1C and base any clinical decisions on it. And then there are the hemoglobin variants that we're going to talk about later that can interfere in the assay. So let's talk about age. Is there one A1C threshold for all ages? 
and I know the guidelines suggest that at a value of 6.5%, this is strongly suggestive of the presence of diabetes. So if you look at the data um, illustrated by three uh, quotes here, there's no consensus in the literature. But if we looked at data from different ethnic groups and look at the age versus the median A1C value, all of them show the same trend. On the left-hand side, at the lowest age, tends to be the lowest point in the graph. Those on the right hand, the highest age, tend to have the highest values. So there is an increase in mean A1C value for age. So therefore we have to look and say, is that 6.5% applicable across age all age groups? Within these charts, there are Caucasians, Mexican Americans, and Blacks. And you will see that there's actually quite a difference between the three. This is an illustration of the ethnic diversity of hemoglobin A1C. So having issued some caveats about using it for di the diagnosis of diabetes or as an aid in the diagnosis of diabetes, let's turn to the second use, which is monitoring patients with diabetes. Now two large trials, the, the Diabetes Complication Control Trial performed in patients with type 2, 1 diabetes and the United Kingdom Prevention of Diabetes study performed on type 2 diabetes showed that excellent control as expressed by the A1C of seven point, less than 7% showed remarkable reduction in the complications of diabetes, particularly retinopathy. So if we look at a chart of A1C versus relative risk of a complication, you look at microalbuminemia, urea, neuropathy, nephropathy, and diabetic retinopathy, as the A1C increases, so does the risk relative risk. So the reason the value of 7.0 was chosen is because at that value there is not much increase in the relative risk of complications of diabetes. So how often should we test? So there is a paper suggesting that in every three months in individuals who are undergoing changes in therapy or are poorly controlled, or every six months in individuals who show good glycemic stability. Now the British NICE guidelines suggest that if you test after 20 days, that is strongly indicative of a trend, but should not be used as an absolute change, just a trend to see which way the patient is going. So does more frequent testing lead to better outcomes? So in this study performed in the United Kingdom, optimal testing frequency to, mag uh, to maximize the downward trajectory in A1C was four times a year, particularly in those individuals who had an initial A1C greater than seven. If they tested every three months, there was an associated 3.8% reduction in A1C compared to a 1.5% decrease with yearly testing. I think this is a very strong argument to suggest that we should be monitoring patients every three months uh, for their A1C to detect a, uh, which way the A1C is going. Now it can be overutilized like all tests. And in Edmonton we found that the most frequent testing interval between repeat A1C testing was 28 days. And so we introduced a rule that said we're going to block all ordering of A1C at less than 90 days. And on average, we reduced the number of A1C tests by between 8% uh, in the first 12 months and 12% over the next six months. So it's a test that can be overutilized. We chose 90 days or three months because we had strong evidence in the literature that this is the optimal time and frequency for testing of A1C to ensure the best uh, results. So what have we done with this large, what are the responses to this large increase in A1C testing due to patients now being tested with it as an aid to the diagnosis of diabetes? And once diagnosed with diabetes, they're monitored four times a year. What has been the response? So first of all, manufacturers have built new instruments with increased 
throughput. Laboratories have had to deal in various ways with this increase. They've bought new instrumentation with increased throughput. They've increased the workday from a single shift to a double shift doing A1C analysis. They've tried to improve efficiency and they've tried to man minimize overtesting. All these strategies are aimed at different population groups. What methods do we have for measuring hemoglobin A1c? Traditionally, they're divided up into two groups. The first is a methods based on charge differences, HPLC and capillary electrophoresis being the strongest members of this group. And the second group, uh, based on structural differences, such as baronet affinity, immunoassay, and enzymatic assay. All methods based on uh, structural differences have an Achilles heel. Even though they have a high throughput and good analytical precision, the Achilles heel is the inability to detect the presence of hemoglobin F and the inability to detect the presence of a variant. The inability to detect the presence of hemoglobin F is important because you really have no idea whether the true answer is uh, the answer produced or whether the answer produced is being affected by the presence of hemoglobin F. In the presence of a hemoglobin variant uh, cannot be detected by the structural methods because the analytical principles on which they are based uh, specifically rule out the detection of hemoglobin variants. So th <clears throat> on the basis of that, charge-based methods have a superiority in that they can pick up the presence of hemoglobin F and the presence of a hemoglobin variant. So earlier on we talked about the increased demand for better testing in A1C. So now within the laboratory we have to have a precision of below 2%. That's a high order to achieve. And for within methods the laboratory precision goal is now set to be below 3.5%. What this chart represents is data taken from the College of American Pathologists hemoglobin A1C proficiency testing program in which the mean hemoglobin A1C is represented on the x-axis and the precision is represented on the y-axis. This data was collected over a period of years for a number of uh, analytical methodologies. If you look at the graph, you will notice that the HPLC methods are towards the lower end of the graph. In other words, they perform the best, whereas the immunoassay and enzymatic methods went towards the top end of the graph. This graph clearly shows that the immunoassay method and the enzymatic methods do not perform nearly as well from a precision perspective as HPLC. So, there is a strategy. We see a high A1C. Is that for real? We see a low A1C. Is that for real? So, the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry suggests that you repeat the test if the A1C is below the reference interval or it's above 15%. Well, if you use the same method and you have a half decent method, all you've done is prove the goodness of your method because you will get the same result. It's possible to use an alternative analyzer, but what we do in our laboratory is that in the case of when the hemoglobin A1c is greater than 13%, we check to see if there is a serum glucose result or a urine glucose result. If the serum result is high and the A1c is high, we have concordance. As, as in some of the previous cases, the serum value is high and the A1C is low, then obviously we have a problem, we have discordant, which we need to resolve. When the A1C is low, as in the case of less than 4%, we now have a policy that we check the reticulocyte count to see if that's elevated or if the MCV is elevated. In the cases of patients with beta thalassemia, the uh, A1C will be about 0.4% lower than a similar patient um, with the same sort of glycemic control. There is an increased red turnover of red blood cells in patients with beta thalassemia. So it's a useful adjunct. 
to be able to look at some of the CBC results and try to explain why the A1C is high or low. Now the increase of ethnic diversity. In 1995, the predecessor to our current lab, we were given the responsibility for hemoglobinopathy thalassemia testing in northern Alberta. And we may be tested 25 samples a week with the majority of unusual samples being either alpha or beta thalassemia. HBS was the most common variant, but we saw less than one sample a week. So let's move forward to 2015, and we now analyze 50 samples a day. We have five papers published on hemoglobin variants. We have the most frequent hemoglobin variant in our population is hemoglobin S, followed by hemoglobin E, followed by hemoglobin D Punjab, and lastly, hemoglobin C. Now, I know that's a little different than the distribution in the United States. So over the course of one year, we found 702 not previously identified hemoglobin variants. These were found as the result of seeing an additional band on A1C analysis. So 702 individuals were diagnosed as having an hemoglobinopathy based on their A1C analysis. Of that 702, 53% were alpha chain variants, 658 were beta chain variants, and we found alpha, uh, hemoglobin A2 prime found in black populations were noted on several occasions. Now here's an ethical dilemma. Is it right to report the presence of a variant rather than report the possible presence of a variant? In Canada, we're allowed to report the presence of a variant and identify it. In other jurisdictions, you will probably not be able to do that. So is it important to know if a variant is present? And I'd like to thank Biorad for letting me use this old um, uh, ad that they had, primarily because Snookums was the name we gave to our daughter uh, when she was young. Uh, and so we, we kind of like the ad. And you can see the very important difference in message between the left-hand side of the note paper and the right-hand side of the note paper. The left-hand side, sorry, goodbye. The right-hand says, I would break my heart if I ever had to say goodbye. And what it's trying to advertise is the fact that it is very important to be able to get the full picture to know that if there is a hemoglobin variant present. So why? Well, we know we need to know if the A1C value is low due to the presence of a hemoglobin variant, such as H disease. We need to know if the interference producing a high result is possible from variants like hemoglobin hope or hemoglobin Athens, Georgia, or any of those other unusual hemoglobin variants. We need to know the identity, not just that it's there, but we need to know the identity of the hemoglobin variant because patients with hemoglobin S have a median A1C 0.4% higher than patients without hemoglobin S. So the discussion now becomes, is 6.2% or 7% the value that we use as a threshold for good glycemic control the same in Caucasians as it is in individuals with hemoglobin S. Tremendous controversy in the literature on this point. One question I'm often asked is, what's the lowest A1C you've ever seen? And our, my response is, we've seen a value of 1.7%. The retic absolute reticulocyte count was tremendously high. This patient had autoimmune hemolytic anemia an immunoassay gave a result that was not different, of less than 4.2. Didn't tell us how low it actually went. Whereas with A1C done by HPLC, we were able to see how low it was. The other question that was posed to me is, can we generate hemoglobin F? And the answer is yes. Here's an 86-year-old female who had a A1C performed uh, two years ago and there was no hemoglobin F. 
Then, a year later, she had a hemoglobin F done, and, the a, and it was 29%. The A1C was 5%. Now, the hemoglobin F has risen to 31%. The A1C is now 4.7%. By the way, on immunoassay, it was only 3.8%. So how can this person generate hemoglobin F when she's 86 years old? The answer is she's taken a drug, hydroxyurea, which increases the production of hemoglobin F and is often used as an adjunct in chemotherapy. So let's take a look at the hemoglobin variants, the good, the bad, the ugly. The good is where the variant does not interfere with A1C measurements. Typical of hemoglobin C, hemoglobin OR. The bad is when you can see the variant, know it interferes, but can't do much about it. So those are hemoglobin J's, hemoglobin Hall, hemoglobin Camden, and K. Woolwich. The ugly is when you do not know that a variant is present, such as with hemoglobin New York or with hemoglobin Wayne, as we discussed earlier. So let me give you some examples. Is a 58-year-old male, African-American, fasting glucose 6.7%. One HPLC method gives us A1C value of 0. Second HPLC method gives us 50.7. Immunoassay gives us 3.8. Obviously, 0 is absurd. 50.7 is absurd. And one might be very tempted to say that the immunoassay value is correct. In actual fact, it's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is it's only measuring half the amount of, tr of A1C present in the sample. This hemoglobin, K. Woolwich, is actually found quite frequently in black Americans. A number is always given if you use an immunoassay, but is it right? So here we have two siblings who had a glucose performed, 5.9 and 5.1 respectively. On HPLC, we got zero. When we did immunoassay, you can get any result you like varying from 5.0 to 8.9%. When we looked further, these two siblings have SC disease. There's no hemoglobin A. Therefore, there can be no hemoglobin A1C. So whatever the immunoassay is measuring is not hemoglobin A1C. There's also trouble, by the way, with SC disease in that it has decreased red cell survival of only 28 days and would, would expect lower values. So here's the identification of hemoglobin variants. Hemoglobin H. We see this quite frequently. It's a three uh, alpha chain deletion. It's found quite frequently in individuals that come from the Mediterranean origin. The MCV is quite low. Um, you will notice at, on the left hand side there, there are two large bands in the C gram. We call them rabbit ears and the uh, hemoglobin A1c is quite low. So this is quite easily, by looking at it, and a trained technologist can look and say, this is the present of hemoglobin H. This patient will always have a low A1c. So here's a common hemoglobin variant, E. It's quite widely distributed in Thai, Thailand and Malaysia. On the left-hand side, you will see a homozygous hemoglobin E on, on the variant, and on the right-hand side, you will see it on the new D100. So patients with homozygous E have increased red cell turnover, so you can expect them to have decreased A1C. The only difficulty is they should have no A1C because they have no hemoglobin A. So here's the bad. The bad is hemoglobin S. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a patient with homozygous S. On the right-hand side, you will see it the same patient or a similar patient analyzed on a D100. So here's the presence of homozygous hemoglobin S. The presence of the variant is identified. We know what it is. We know that any result that is generated is invalid. And so we can report out that this patient has homozygous S. You need to be cautious in uh, treating this patient uh, for their diabetes. A1C in the presence of a hemoglobin variant, the ugly. 
So we have a single diagram here of hemoglobin wane. We published this paper in um, a Diabetes Care, and we wanted to entitle it Dealing with Wayne's World. Welcome to Wayne's World, except that we weren't allowed to publish it on that title without cleaning it up. So Wayne is a really difficult one to pick up. It shows a hemoglobin F because there is Wayne 1, and there's also Wayne 2, which eludes with hemoglobin A1C. So Wayne 1 um, eludes with uh, hemoglobin F, Wayne 2 eludes with hemoglobin A1C. So we have some challenges, in particular in picking up this um, hemoglobin variant. However, the D100 is set to pick up this particular hemoglobin variant, although it cannot say this is hemoglobin wane present. Now here's the huge debate. The clinical effect of the variant. In patients with hemoglobin S have a higher mean or a higher mean A1C value than patients without a hemoglobin variant. That's very important when you start using fixed thresholds, both for the diagnosis and for the monitoring of patients. Patients with beta thalassemia have lower A1C than those without beta thalassemia. Again, that becomes important when you have a single set fixed threshold. So here's the conclusion. The increase in incidence of diabetes has resulted in increased A1C testing requests as an aid in the diagnosis and monitoring of diabetes. Newer instrumentation has been made to meet this increased demand. Within the laboratory, we need to set the imprecision at below 2%, and for within, uh, within labs, between methods, we need to get below 3.5%. It's also important to be able to detect and identify the presence of a variant. The road may be tough. Hemoglobin A1C analysis is not like glucose analysis. There are a lot of facets that one needs to understand in order to get the correct, analytically useful, clinically useful result to the, to the physician. And it's like going up to this particular meadow to look at this tremendously impressive glacier. The road may be tough, but in the end, it is worthwhile. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.